Marty Nemco is an author, career specialist, and education expert. He has written over 3,000 published articles on all sorts of subjects for publications such as Time, The Atlantic, and Psychology Today. His way of approaching the world is practical, but often unusual. And I'm delighted to be joined by Marty today. So Marty, thank you very much to, uh, for, for giving me this time this morning. My pleasure. You're over in Oakland, California. So it's 9 a.m., is that correct? Yeah. And, and you grew up on the East Coast. So can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? Um, your parents survived horrible things in Europe um, before they, they came to the free world. So can you talk to me a bit about all that? Yeah, my uh, parents were both Holocaust survivors. And, uh, you know, everybody says their father is their inspiration, but my father really was. Uh, he was one of those guys who didn't talk about it a lot. He didn't live in the past. He kept moving forward. And maybe the most telling thing is despite the Holocaust uh, and despite working for minimum wage in a factory in Harlem, <clears throat> he uh, saved up enough money for the only, the only store he could afford to rent, a crappy little store in a terrible neighborhood in New York. And he... Uh, um, was he worked like really he really worked seven days a week serving a community that wasn't his at all and in fact his community didn't even like him even though he was extremely honest and provided a great service of clothing at low low cost he was the only Jew who uh, who owned a store and they in the middle of the night three times the police called us uh, that they that somebody had thrown a, a, a gasoline soaked rag down the chimney and uh burned out my father's store and my father the quiet you know hard-working guy rebuilt three times in a row and so when i see now all this, this the, the community burning down cities and they're always talking about that just being unrest or protest you know it, it really doesn't do fair service to the shopkeepers who work their asses off to provide a good service to people completely other than their community and so that's one of the things that, you know, I think stands out in my mind as a core injustice. And I'm really proud of my father for his resilience and coming back from the Holocaust and those arsons. So the arsons, you say it wasn't, um, they weren't, your, your father wasn't serving his community. And by that, do you mean he wasn't serving Jewish people? Right, it was all black and Latino. Who surrounded, who surrounded the shop? It was all blacks okay. and Latinos. And they didn't, they didn't like uh, what you guys were. Apparently, well, he was the only guy who got burned out and it would happen three times. And there were a lot of other wow. store owners. So we don't know what their real motives are. They never caught them, but you know, it, it implied if he was the only guy and they did it three times. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very welcoming and, attitude from the community. No, clearly not. And, and you spoke um, I saw you last night talking about two ways that Holocaust survivors deal with um, their past, broadly speaking. And um, I was quite fascinated by the approach that your father seems to have, ta have taken, you know. So can you can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know, I, I grew up knowing maybe, a, I don't know, 15 Holocaust survivors, and they seemed to break into two general categories. It was like a continuum, but they broke into two categories. One were the people who lived in the past. They went to all the Holocaust remembrances. They talked about the Holocaust, you know, and they were generally less happy people. They were more miserable and a chip on their shoulders. Now, some of it may have been that they started out that way. But then there was this other group of people who, like my dad, who said, you know, uh, and my dad said the most powerful thing, I'll never forget it. He says, you know, I asked my dad why he so rarely talked about the Holocaust, and he stiffened, which he rarely did. And he said, Martin, the Nazis took five years from my life. I won't give them one minute more. He said, Martin, never look back. Always take the next step forward. And I have found that not only inspirational and helpful to me, but when I look at, I've had 6,000 career counseling clients, and I look at what are the big differentiators? And one of them really is that the successful ones have had failures, but they're much more likely to follow my father's advice about, yeah, learn some lessons from it, but never look back, always take the next step forward. You um, are obviously quite a high achiever, but you had some kind of more humble uh, jobs and, and odd jobs, I suppose. So um, what would you say you might've learned in your in, when you were a young man from 
from what you were doing like before you reached the the ivory towers you know um you were a cab driver if i'm not mistaken and and a piano player which which i'm intrigued by uh, yeah. so what, what was that or what what did that how did that form you let's say my first job was actually uh, uh sending out billing notices for a furniture store and it i i really do believe that all work is worthy work whether you're a ditch digger if you're doing it right or you're a cab driver, which I was, or a piano player in bars, which I was. Uh, you know, I, I feel like as long as you're ethical and working hard, there's almost nothing more important. I think today's obsession with work-life balance, with an emphasis on the life part, where you you know it's you know it's important to hang out, to meditate, to you know it's cool to allow time to hang out with your partner and watch your know, binge watch you know Better Call Saul or whatever the hell it is, you know. I, uh, I am an, an odd duck in that I really do think my father was right. My father worked 70 hours a week. I work 70 hours a week. And I believe for me, not for, I think for everybody, that that is a life better led. To take hours 40 through 60 in a work week. And I have one, you know, two people. One, you're an Irish guy. So, you know, one goes to the pub and has the Guinness and, you know, ha and has a good time with his friends and gets shit faced and gets laid and all the rest of it. And then somebody else who chooses to say, you know what? I'm going to spend hours 40 to 60, whether I'm a ditch digger or I'm a teacher or I'm a career counselor or whatever, and says, so, shit, I'm going to go and spend it making the biggest difference I can. To me, there is no question that that second person has lived a better life, notwithstanding that I don't mind a good Guinness occasionally. <laughs> good stuff. And obviously, to, to, to give the devil its due, I'm sure you can find you know a happy medium between those two extremes. But you have clearly opted for the... The heavy workload and and um so can you talk to me what what is a day like for you because i know I, I hope you don't mind me saying you're 70 years old i saw you had a video <laughs> where you where you sang and played the piano um for your neighbors which was lovely and um, so you're past in inverted commas retirement age but you're still going at it full throttle it seems absolutely my typical day and i wouldn't change it is i'm up at around you know, 7 seven thirty. Uh, I, my dog, uh, usually will wake me up as well. And we, we take a hike, my sweet dog, Hachi, we take a little hike, get a little morning exercise. I put up the coffee actually, before I do that, have my coffee. Uh, and I like to sit for about 15 minutes when I get back before I, and I think about, you know, what do I want to do today that I haven't already scheduled? What do I think about what's important? And I write in a journal, here's the journal. Not every day. But I write in a journal and I, you know, I, so I, I, I live an intentioned life. Then I start to write usually my psychology today article. I've written 1850 articles of psychology today. And I feel it's a privilege. They let me write every day with no editor. I can write whatever the hell I want, basically, unless I say, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you all the time. But <laughs> I can write whatever I want and it can, it gets published. So um, between around roughly 8.30 and 10, uh, I'm writing and think, you know, I'm writing. And then I take a shower and get ready for my first client. My first client, I routinely start, my career counseling clients start 1045. And I basically see clients nonstop, you know, with little breaks for lunch and a hike. I take a big hike with my doggy in the middle of the day. Uh, we've got lovely areas to hike. They're hilly. I want to, even though I'm 70, I'm in great shape and good shape. I don't know, that's just bragging. I'm in good shape and I want to, um, you know, stay that way. So Hachi and I take our, our big hike. Uh, then I get back and I see clients. Then, um, uh, you know, I see a client in the evening too. So I have to eat a, a little dinner at, you know, six or seven. And then I see one more client. And then um, I see my, then I hang out with my wife. And we, uh, you know, like we do that, as I said, watch movies, binge watch, whatever, and hang out. Uh, so, so you're guilty with, just, just like yeah. everyone else. <laughs> yeah, like everyone else. <laughs> yes, lovely. Uh, well, um you you seem to have a, a, a view of the world right where you try to cut through the bs that's kind of the impression i get and and the hype and the gurus maybe and the the pop psych and all that right so what would you say can you can you put your finger on one single uh lie maybe that's being propagated or, or kind of lived I know it's a very general thing, but but is there one one particular lie that that exists, let's say, in American thought uh, that that really doesn't doesn't cut the mustard? Right. Do you think? 
which I, I think is that the that the implication, especially among Americans, less so among Europeans, is that we are infinitely malleable. That if you work hard enough and you know you believe and all the rest of it, you can achieve anything. That's bullshit. Um, genetics, we you know in every other environment, in every other context, we acknowledge that we are significantly the genetics predisposes us to all kinds of successes and failures. And yes, environment, excuse me, environment matters. But look, I've played basketball my whole life, and I'm still going to be a slow white guy. You know, I just you know I can barely touch the rim. I can't dunk. I'm not saying, you know, all white guys are all black guys. What I'm saying is we there are certain endowments and nobody has tried harder to be a great basketball player. I really have played a lot. I can't tell you how much time I spend practicing dribbling with the opposite hand, trying to develop a stutter step, reading about basketball, playing a zillion games. You know, I'm still, I suck, relatively speaking. You know, I can hold my own in a street guard game, but, I, you know, I'm, I suck. And I think that we need to recognize and the, the, the pop psych, to use your term, people are endlessly saying, well, you know, you can really conquer this with meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy and perhaps augmented by drugs. And yes, sometimes they have their place. But I think this notion that everybody thinks they can be whatever they want if they just work hard enough is crap. I think we need to, it's wiser to acknowledge one's limitations and strengths and instead of keep trying to move yourself to this next, this high level, but rather to say, okay, given my natural strengths and weaknesses and preferences and limitations, where would I fit best? Where am I most likely to succeed? And I think the whole pop psych industry is antithetical to that. And as you say yourself, don't follow your passion. So sometimes, right. sometimes, exactly. So how do your clients respond when you, when you say something like that? Like, is there a bit of a, a deflation on the first meeting or, or do people kind of know maybe what to expect when, when they meet you? First of all, I think there needs to be a prerequisite. It's not just, I think we need to say why it's dangerous to follow your passion. And that is because most people's passions reside in just a few areas, the environment, entertainment, sports, uh, being a, uh, you know, environmentalist. And the problem is that <clears throat> there are so many more people who want to do that than there are jobs that it, really stacks the odds again, being an actor, being a musician, whatever, it stacks the odds against you. And so, and, and the, the irony is that even if you were to get a job as an actor, as a musician, as a broadcaster, the odds are you're gonna be treated like shit and get paid crappy because so many people are waiting in the wings just willing to do it for nothing, right? And so by telling people, go follow your passion, especially if it's one of those widely held passions, the statistics are you're setting them up for failure. Yes, if you're brilliant, you're really hard work, you're well connected. Your father is, you know, a big Hollywood mogul. Fine. But the average person who comes to a career counselor doesn't have all that stuff going for him or her. And so, no, I don't say come in, you know, they don't they don't know up front that I'm going to be a realist. But and I don't hit him over the head with that. And it depends on the person. Sometimes I do tell people to follow their passion. But when they're telling me that I'm a real committed environmentalist, but they've, they're, you know, like they got half a brain, they're lazy, they do, they do, they do their vape pen, you know, twice a day, you know, they're going to be a volunteer uh, licking envelopes. They ain't going to be making even a sustainable, modest living being the environmentalist. So I don't hit them over the head with it and I don't hit everybody over the head with it, but I am very carefully assessing each individual to say, how much do I need to encourage their vision? How much do I need to give them a dose of reality? And you, you used the term malleable earlier on and th that we are, we, we would be better off to recognize our, our limitations, right? So I'm curious to, and when strength. people come in and exactly. So when people come in your door, how how often do you get someone who just doesn't want to know like you you hear i've there's a, a very famous some people call him a pop psychologist but i think he's a bit more than that a man called jordan peterson you may have heard yeah, him, sure and he he says um don't rescue someone who doesn't want to be rescued basically so do you come across these kinds of people um or, or, is, or can you always kind of can you always get someone you know from from the depths let's say yeah, I, um, that's part of the art of being a good career counselor. I, I recognize how much directness they can take at a given point in time. So I, you know, I, uh, you know while here, because I'm being interviewed, I'm talking a lot, I also do a fair amount of listening and just make decisions all the way along the way, how supportive to be, how critical. 
And so rarely is somebody saying, I don't want to hear that. I still want to be a you know, rock star. Um, but I'm usually more subtle than that. And so I rarely get a client getting pissed. And, you know, and, and we don't fight very much at all. It, it's much more, uh, uh, it's collaborative. I've, you know, I am by nature a fighter. I'm a kid from the Bronx who likes to be aggressive, but that doesn't work in the counseling world. So I've learned to, to be careful about when to be aggressive and when not. I will be in your face at times with a client, but that's, I keep that as a nuclear option in reserve. I don't go to that pretty quickly. And I'm curious, um, and this is kind of coming up in, in America today. Obviously, people talk about discrepancies uh, of income and uh, you hear terms of privilege and, and things like that. And what you never hear people talk about, um, I've pointed out to some people, is Jewish privilege. Um, and maybe if we did start talking about Jewish privilege, we'd be accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, but the reason I bring this up is... Um, ethnically Jewish, whether they're religiously practicing or not, these people are disproportionately wealthy and successful in a host of professions. And I am wondering, why do you think that is, what do these people do that the rest of us don't? And, and from which the rest of us might be able to learn, uh, exactly. practically speaking. The Jews for thousands of years have always valued hard work and intelligence and education. And so both in terms of the culture and what they encourage as parents, but also genetically, the greatest honor for thousands of years for a woman would be to marry the rabbi's son or the rabbi, the smartest guy. It wasn't who's got the most buff six pack. It isn't who's the coolest and bad boy. It is who is the smartest, hardworking and ethic, ethic. Jewish ethics is very, very important. It is really core to the Jewish tradition. And like most Jews are not religious at all, at all. They are, but they do value, you know, and there are many exceptions. There are, there are lazy, stupid Jews. Of course there are. But as an overall culture, the Jews value intelligence, both in choosing a spouse and who makes the babies. And so genetically over hundreds of generations, you're, build, you're breeding in for intelligence. And so it's, it's both the genetics and that culture that values hard work and ethics, but also... One of the big differences between the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Jews, of course, only believe in the Old Testament, even if they're atheist, is there is, they don't think it's bad to be willful. The New Testament talks all the time about don't be too willful. The meek shall inherit the earth. Have faith and, and, and the, the God will move mountains. That is not part of the Jewish tradition. And that's why Jews can be more aggressive and see more. And that's why a lot of Christians hate them. They say, look with these pushy Jews. But it's born of a wanting to make a difference and just sometimes just be successful. Sometimes like, oh, like Christians, like everybody make money. But why did you succeed? It is the combination of that selecting spouses who are going to be really intelligent and hardworking. And then a culture that values hard work, uh, education, and willfulness. It is not a bad thing to be willful if you're Jewish, as long as it's for an ethical purpose. You know, if you're one of those assholes, you know, like uh, uh, Bernie Madoff or uh, Harvey Weinstein, of course, that's an, we, every Jew is embarrassed to have anything to do with those jerks. But most Jews work their asses off and are smart and are willful and are proud of it. So, as you say, uh, while people a lot of them don't um, say believe in in the the, the, the religion or whatever. Uh, do you think this will decrease as time goes on and also as as they intermarry? Uh, I think I don't know. Did I see this from you or or elsewhere? But I something like less than half of, of Jews marry Jews. Is that correct? That's correct. Even though you know a lot of the people who are anti-Semitic say the Jews are insular. That's ridiculous. Half more than half of Jews intermarry Christians, uh, and more than more than half raise their children not Jewish. Because the Jewish religion is hard. It's, it's boring. It's long. Services are in a foreign language. They're two, two hours long. Most Jews are totally not religious. And the media has done such a good job of making Jews feel like they're, they're privileged. But it's earned privilege. What I've described, there's a big difference between privilege. You, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you know, you're a lazy piece of shit and you still got millions. But many Jews, and I don't want to be across, you know, there, there are plenty of people who earned their privilege, 
My father, as you know, was was wrested from his home as a child and taken to the concentration camps, and he escaped with a bunch of men. And then he was dumped in the Bronx, New York, without a penny to his name, no money, no English, no education, no nothing, no family. And he worked his ass off. And so yeah, he never got rich, but he was, he finally moved us out of the tenement in the Bronx to a, a duplex, bottom half of a two-family house in, uh, in, in Flushing, Queens, a middle-class neighborhood. He earned, it wasn't privilege, he earned everything he fucking got. And that is really critical to differentiating. And that's why I do get angry. I know I'm supposed to only be concerned, but no, I get angry when they take people like my father and the many other, and I'm not talking about just Jews, all those Korean grocers, all those immigrants who were, all the, the Chinese who built the railroads who were enslaved, all the Japanese and Americans who were in internment camps, who worked their ass off and were successful. How dare the media call them privileged? They have worked for what they've gotten. And other groups have not worked as hard or as successfully or delayed its gratification. And so I hate the word privilege if it's applied to people who earned their their success. So how how should we uh, and I use that term we like lightly I'm not American right but how should America do you think on a practical level approach the um disproportionately held um opportunity and and all of that and and wealth and and all sorts of societal, I, I won't say the, the word systemic, but like societal brokenness, right? That, that does disproportionately affect certain areas and, and certain, certain identity groups. How, how do we take that on? Um, or, or do you think this is kind of, this is the way it's going to be, you know, indefinitely? My ethics say that every human being apart from merit, apart from hard work is entitled to a basic level of life. That is basic health care, basic housing, basic education, even though that creates a disincentive to work. That said, when we go beyond that basic safety net for everybody, we are then eating our seed corn. I don't know if that's a term they use in Ireland, but when you, when you uh, plant, if a farmer plants a farm and he's using the corn seeds that would have been used to grow the next year's crop, he guarantees his failure. And I have seen, we have already redistributed a huge amount from the top 10% pay 68% of the federal income tax. And every time we tax them, we're going to kill jobs. We're going to kill motivation for the successful to work. I mean, the left, I think, is talking about even potentially even breaking up Amazon because they're successful. And yet they bring, Amazon brings such joy to millions of people who are able to, whether they're rural or urban or whatever, to buy whatever product at a fair price in a fair marketplace. And also Amazon Web Services provides great services to all the small and medium and large businesses that create, um, that create websites. You know, if we tear apart them, we are essentially um, eating our seed corn. And we're going to, yes, we'll redistribute and the poor will get more than the, just the basics which is what I do think the, the Biden-Harris administration wants. But in the end, we will make everybody equal, but equally less, equally poorer, and not have a, a society that we all want. So basics, my values are basic safety net for all, apart from any uh, merit. But then we have to be very careful about additional redistribution beyond already, where, or as I said, the top 10% pay 68% of the federal income tax, because we will be eating our seed corn. One um, thing, two birds with one stone here. You, you mentioned Amazon, and I um, got very enthusiastic in early 2020 and late 2019 about Andrew Yang because I thought that he was a, a Democratic candidate who wasn't as obsessed with um, certain topics and more kind of genuinely progressive in, in that he seemed to to be looking at, at serious issues coming down the tracks. and. And he often talked about Amazon and one of his big qualms with Amazon was about the tax and, and how they really d don't pay a lot of tax. But, but he pointed out and made pains to do so uh, uh, to, to deaf ears, but that automation is going to result in huge um, unemployment th uh, at, a, at a rate that is unprecedented. Uh, so what would you say to the, the person whose job might be really, you know, threatened by all of this, 
Um, and, and, and then again, by extension, he, he talked uh, as a solution. I don't know, is it the solution? But he brought up the universal basic income thing as a way to, to deal with this. It, it won't fix it, but it's, it's one measure, you know. Many, many questions there. So here's, here's some, some thoughts. Um, there was, I believe, <clears throat> and, you know, I am not an expert on this, but I believe it was one year that Amazon paid very little tax. I think they're paying much more tax now. I am certainly, I don't, there's a difference between, I mean, I am in favor of a tax law that is, that is fair. And that would mean that an Amazon that makes millions of dollars should pay a reasonable amount of tax. Absolutely. Um, I think that the left has cherry picked isolated incidents where I remember one year General Electric didn't pay, but corporations pay a huge amount in tax. And it's, it's like double taxing because a, a given, if I am, for example, if I am investing in Amazon, if I have my, I, I work my ass off, I save some money, I put it in a share of Amazon stock. Amazon is already paying a fair amount of tax now most of the time. And I additionally pay tax on anything I've gained from it. So they're getting plenty. It's not like they're getting, they're not getting any tax money. With regard to a guaranteed basic income, that's kind of the basic safety net I'm talking about. The most of the research is showing a mixed benefit from a guaranteed basic income. Yes, it ensures a basic safety net, but he was talking about 12,000 a year. And, um, that is not really enough to live on very much. But if you if you give everybody much more than that, you're not only breaking the you know bank, but you're more importantly, even you're creating a greater disincentive to not work. I remember coming, following either somewhere in that time period, they were saying uh, in 30 states, you make more money sitting home on welfare than working at a, a $20 an hour job as an administrative assistant. And in 12 states, it was, and again, please, these are just off the top of my head. Don't these facts, you know, don't fact check me, but this is the best of my recollection. In 11 states, you made more than a teacher by sitting on your ass and taking care of, you know, that kind of disincentive is not a formula for, for a good country. Uh, automation is a different and hard, hard problem. Um, I don't have an answer for this one. If we stop automation, if we're Luddites and we just say, we're gonna keep these jobs, well, we're not gonna do it worldwide. So every country which is already eating our lunch in China, whatever, are going to automate and provide our products and services far more less expensive. But if we allow complete automation, it's going to be mainly the lower to mid-level jobs that are going to get automated. So there's going to be these tens, if not hundreds of millions of Americans who are not going to have the wherewithal to be data scientists and artificial intelligence people. And they're going to not be able to be self-supporting. And so is the answer just a... a, a uh, this guaranteed basic income. I don't know what's going to happen to those hundreds of millions, those millions of people who are uh, who are not able to to will not be able to work in the post information society. Sorry, Marty. This is um this comes with the nature of of this medium. I actually lost you uh, in between. I lost you after you talked about you earn more in some states than a teacher would. Uh, so I don't know if you can remember how to pick up, but I kind of I didn't get the transition to automation. If if you don't mind just touching on that. Yeah, they were separate. So I, again, I, I don't have, this was not even what we were planning to talk about. So this is just off of my memory from a few, couple of years ago. But if I recall at some point, maybe right before or during the Andrew Yang uh, uh, candidacy, when there was studies that found that in 30 states, uh, you earn more money sitting on your butt than, than an administrative assistant would make. And I believe in something in 11 states, you actually made more than a teacher. Um, but you would you would ask me a question about Andrew Yang, which included three or four components, one of which was the automation. And on the automation front, I said, I, I don't have a smart answer because I'm worried. I really am worried in this post-information society where uh, most of the jobs that are going to get automated are low to mid-level, that there will be tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who are not going to have the wherewithal to be artificial intelligence programmers and the like, or doctors or lawyers. And I very much worry about what's going to happen to them. And that's why I have said, I stipulated up front, I am in favor of a basic safety net for everybody. What that exact amount should be. I do believe, however, for example, for healthcare, that not every, somebody who doesn't pay into the system or somebody who's been here illegally, who you know, is not entitled to the same level of healthcare as somebody who has paid into the system and is, you know, uh, you know, so many, unfortunately, of the non-payers, they are very high users of the system. They, they get, uh, 
they're obese, they're drug abusers, they, they, uh, they're gang, vi gang violence, et cetera. And, uh, and our system is already, our healthcare system is already broken. Over 350,000 people die every year because of medical errors in hospitals alone. So we're gonna take all these people and we're gonna give them equal healthcare to the people who are le here legally and contribute to the system and are not obese and are not drug abusers and are not in gang violence. There's something wrong about that. So my basic level of uh, recommendation of basic levels that everybody, I don't care you're, how worthy you are, gets a basic level of care. But it seems cosmically unjust to expect to, to provide. To, for me, for example, who's paid in my system my whole life to be at greater risk of dying or excess morbidity because uh, I am, the system is already overwhelmed and, and, and the left insists on equal health care, whether I've paid into the system, whether I've been responsible or I'm, I'm not. Just a very quick thing. If you could tilt your camera a little bit, uh, we're not seeing the very top of your head, but it's As only well, you shouldn't. <laughs> you have the head, nice head of hair. I, I want to keep it just like this. Good. Well, um, I, I want to ask you now, uh, you, you had a video, I think it's nine years old now, and this is how I stumbled across you. And it's very cleverly named what colleges and universities don't want you to know. So I want to ask you, um, what is it that colleges and universities don't want to know for, for people who haven't seen uh, that video? Some of the major things are A, that the freshman to senior growth in those critical things that the college is supposed to teach you, that is critical thinking and writing, et cetera, is frighteningly low. Uh, again, the, these numbers are not exactly right, but 36% of those uh, people grew not at all in um, from freshman to senior, senior year. I think 45% grew only tri trivially. So the amount of learning is far less than um, what they imply. Um, it used to be in 1970, only 40% of, of kids went to college. And so you get a college degree and it pretty much was a, not a guarantor, but certainly uh, you, you could pretty much count on getting a decent job. Now we send 70% to college. So everybody, employers now yawn at a, at a college degree. So it's far from the guarantor. Sure, it signals that you're willing to work, you know, to do, do college and you've learned something, and some many employers still rely on it as a, a screening tool, but uh, it's far from a guarantee or a guarantor of employment. Uh, and the third thing is that the uh, uh, living in the uh, the dorms, which is seen as the lovely halfway house between the protection of home and the independence of adulthood, it ends up being a, a, too often a den for sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and dropping out. And in fact, only about 40% of all students who start as freshmen graduate, even if given six years. No, that's wrong. It's 60% uh, graduate if given six years. So the chances are pretty damn good. You're going to drop out, not learn a lot, not be that employable and have a mountain of debt. And now when you add the COVID distance thing on top of it, it's, you know, you're, the one thing that kids really loved was to be able to have all this human interaction. And now that's, you know, for, you know, how we don't, nobody knows really whether it's in another six months, year, two years, four years, you know, people who are signing up now for college have to assume there's going to be a fair amount of distance learning and therefore being deprived for the human, uh, the, the human interaction. So that's why for not all, but for many students, especially if you were sick of high school, and bored and not really that much looking forward to college, it's wise to consider other options like apprenticeship, uh, learning on the job, uh, even the military. And you know, I was thinking to myself, um, as I was sharing today, that you could break it down roughly into two types of people who, let's say two types of parents uh, with regard to college. You could have parents who have gone to college and who are doing um, well in terms of income and all that and I think for these kind of people it would actually be a bit embarrassing to the neighbours and to the other parents if my son Johnny was a bit you know disinterested and, and so there's that but then also there is uh, everyone else not everyone else but there's an awful lot of people who didn't go to college and for their son or daughter to go to college and you hear this term first generation student it's a huge source of pride and you can understand that you know um, it, it is seen in America as a step up in the world so um, it seems to me personally that this is going to keep on going um, but maybe the virus is going to is going to put an end to that like do you think the penny's going to drop um, pardon the pun you know about all this 
Yeah, I think it, it's slowly changing. When they see how many suckers, oh, that's too strong. How many kids went to college, worked their asses off, and even defied the odds, and they were this in the 60% of graduate, and still can't find a decent job, and they're working as a barista, and they're living on their parents' sofa. You know, that myth that, the, that it's really a step up is, is beginning to, to fade, because you, you see that it's, you're, and I use the word sucker, and maybe it was too strong, but if you're spending 100,000, 200,000, even, you know, for four years of college, you know, and sometimes up to 300,000 for four years of college, and you get so little for it in terms of learning and employability, you know, it's no longer the source of pride. You're almost being a fool for having spent all that money. So the, the, all the people who, who, have, who are in those two categories, who themselves were successful, are forgetting that it's a new world now with all more kids going to college, you know, and when that forces colleges to dumb down the instruction and lowers the quality of the, of the dorm life when, when dorms reopen, you know, so they're living in the path. They're saying, well, it worked for me. It's going to work for my kid. It's a different generation. Things have changed. And those who didn't go to college, they're living on this, this, this ethereal dreamland about what college is supposed to be. It's the myths that are, that myth is too strong. The, salesmanship that the colleges and the media um, perpetrate, that this is the path up, this is the path out. And yes, it is for some. If you are, for example, my son or daughter was dutiful and did okay in high school and was looking forward to college, not just the social life, but the academics. And the kid wasn't, and my kid wasn't a self-starter. My kid needed the structure of school. He or she is only going to do well in that structure. Again, of course, I'm going to send my kid to college. No problem. But if my kid is either really bored with school, hated school, was likely to get away and, and then get away and just rebel, I don't want to spend the $200,000 or $100,000 that I probably don't even have and I got to take on all the student loan. So it's going to vary with the kid. One size does not fit all. I'm working right now with a tennis coach. He is uh, 65. He's been teaching tennis for 46 years. And he often talks about how in the tennis world, America used to be number one uh, for a very long time. And, and he, he often quotes John McEnroe, who says, um, who says uh, I could handle when Canada beat America at hockey, but I cannot get over Canada being better than America at tennis. And what this man um, sees in America is um, a kind of, uh, basically a, a, a molly coddling of children where there's no hunger and that's one reason why they're getting overtaken um, by th their Eastern European or Asian counterparts and, and basically the kids are kind of um, treated too too well in, in a sense so how have you seen that change in, in American uh, let's say you, again you've been around for, for a while you, you won't mind me saying so, so so how have attitudes changed to to child rearing um in in a way that has had a, an effect i think it's very variable i'm not willing to say that molly coddle thing that's a that's a traditional conservative argument um i think there are there's a wide range there we, i mean we hear about the tiger moms all the asian american moms who who absolutely make their kid work their ass off all the time and then there are certain ones who you know who are um too too indulging. I certainly don't. I do not think that world class athletes, that the children, are mollycoddled. And if anything, I feel sorry for those Olympic wannabes or the kids who are going to be, the, you know, the next Ilya Nastasi or, uh, uh, you know, any, the the current, you know, I don't remember the names because I don't follow tennis, but Maria Karnakova or whatever. No, I, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they work their ass off from age five or six. They're they're playing tennis with a quarter size racket, and they've got coaches, and and they're working. No, so I'm not going to say they're molly coddled. Nah. No, again, just just to clarify that the it's a I suppose it's a separate thing. You're right. The tiger mother thing is is very present in tennis, particularly. But the distinction there would be that because. Americans don't go hungry, basically, uh, in metaphorically speaking, like they do elsewhere. They don't have that drive, I suppose, that that other countries do. But again, that's that's um, that's that. Uh, yeah, I, I think want. To, yeah, go I on. think it's more likely that the uh, in other countries they've learned some of the best training techniques and whatever, 
And so they, you know, they've caught up. It's absurd to think that America is going to stand alone among other countries. I think among the real high achievers, they're working their ass off plenty. I feel really sorry for the college students, for example, who study 10 hours a day, and some of them do. So, nah, I don't think it's that. I think that the, the rest of the world is appropriately catching up. Mm. And I, I want to ask you, because you obviously help people figure out their life and their career. And uh, for one reason or another, a lot of people mightn't be able to afford that or whatever. But one thing that I think is underused by people my age is the opportunity that comes with mentorship. And this term, especially in Ireland, that term is kind of, I, I don't want to say this too strongly, but a bit sneered at, like, ah, shut up, wow. you know, get over yourself. I, I, again, I don't want to overstate that, but the mentorship thing and reaching out is definitely more common in America. And there's yeah. th that kind of culture exists, I, I would say, more. Um, so can you talk about the, the merits of that, maybe, and, and what, what you might get out of that and, and how to find that kind of a relationship with someone? Yeah, I'm actually a big fan of mentorship, and here's why because it maximizes the amount of individualized instruction as well as the emotional bond. If you're in a class, you're, the class is taught normally at one pace, which may or may not be on target for you. The content may not be relevant to you. If you have a good mentor who's saying, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think you, you should, should you try this? You know, here's some feedback about that. Here, watch me do this. That's the old apprenticeship model. And I think that is individual, that increases the max, the amount of time on relevant task. The question is, it's really, it's quite, you know, you're, I think, incorrect in saying that it's, that mentorship is ubiquitous here. We all crave a mentor, um, but very few really find a mentor. We dream about this wonderful person who's going to take us under wing and mentor us. But most people go through life without much of a mentor. We may get a little advice here and there, but and as I was, I briefly alluded to, apart from the, the individualized instruction, there is the emotional bond that occurs between a mentor and a protege, which actually is therefore motivating to the protege to make them want to work harder. And the mentor feels good about his or her own life because you're helping to mold somebody. So I'm actually a big fan of, of mentorship and apprenticeship. And, and what, how, would you, how would you advise people to approach someone that, or whatever, how do, how do you create that relationship in, to begin with? It's a great question. Slowly. It's like, you don't, you know, if I'm a guy and I'm single, I don't go to a woman and say, you want to go to bed with me. It's too fast. You, it's too much. So it starts by asking, you know, you figure out who is it? Is this person seeming knowledgeable and kind? Kind is really important. And then you start with a single question. You know, you ask that person, you know, I'm having a dilemma in my life. I'm wondering whether I should do X. Here's a bit of the background. Not don't write something long, but here's a bit of my background. Do you have any advice for me? And you see how that person responds. And then if the person responds helpfully, you write a lovely thank you letter, maybe even send a truffle in a box or whatever the hell it is. And that little by little builds the relationship just in the as in dating a little bit at a time. And then it may deepen and it may not. I, I was really struck and I took you up on this challenge by your video on the cold call. And uh, I just want to see, would you have any, because again, you've, you've obviously written about this at length, but but for someone who hasn't come across your work, what are some un, un, underused approaches to to getting a job or getting an opportunity um, and, and things like that that people don't really ever think about doing? I have for many years touted this call email call thing. In other words, to identify 10 target employers who are not advertising a job, leaving a brief voicemail saying, I'm really, uh, I, I, I didn't pick you at random. I uh, was impressed with what you do and what your company does. I am a, a new young person starting out after college, and I'm really eager to find a launchpad job in whatever, whatever it is, nonprofit fundraising, marketing, whatever. Um, and I'm wondering if you might be willing to talk with me a bit. I will. That's the call. And and you say I'm going to email you, uh, you know, this in writing and a little bit about me. And I'd be honored if you'd give me a call. So that's the the call. Then you email them that. You do that then, after hours, right? Just to just to clarify. Yeah, because you don't want to talk with them yet. Because you want to you want him to see or what you have or her to see what you have in writing. And then in a few days, if you haven't heard from them, then you make a follow up call. So that's why I call email call and say hey. I, Hey, this is Marty Nemco. I'm the new college graduate. I was hoping that beyond, you know, I was hoping beyond the odds that we might be able to chat a bit. If you might have some advice, 
but I know how busy you are, but I'm a follow through guy. So I figured I would pick up the phone one time and uh, ask if, you know, you might be willing to talk with me. If not, I won't be a pest. Uh, anyway, here's my number. So that's call, email, call. But in recent years, I've become more, less, it's, I still recommend it at times. I'm less sold on it. Why? From an ethical perspective. People are, not everybody, but people who are in a position to be, to hire you or whatever, are overwhelmed and really busy and working hard. And some unsolicited call can feel like too much. So I'm, it feels pushy, call, email, call. So I'm more inclined of late to ask people just to write a thoughtful, polite email or phone, whichever they're more comfortable with and let it go. Even if it's gonna be less effective from a cosmic justice perspective, it feels too much. What I do incur is an example of an unconventional job search method, because that's what you would ask more broadly. I'm a big fan of the white paper. When you're in college, you are often writing a, a paper. You may have even procrastinated and waited till the last day and wrote it the last, especially if you're trying to change fields or you're a newbie or a new graduate, writing a two or three page paper on a topic that would be of interest to the employer and that would be on target for what you're trying to, uh, uh, to do can often be a way to compensate for lack of experience. To say something, you know, to include, let's say you, you want to be a, uh, uh, oh, uh, an accountant and you have just, you've got major in accounting, but you have no experience whatsoever. So writing a two or three page paper on, you know, what is changing in accounting in 2021? Oh, or cost accounting, you know, being more specific, cost accounting, auditing, whatever it is. Um, and sending that as a work sample can be a nice tool for helping you stand out from among the crowd. What would you say to people who um, procrastinate, whether it's with regard to the job search or uh, something with which I'm very familiar, schoolwork, you know? Um, or is that just a case of laziness? You know, maybe it's a bit of bit of both or whatever. But how how do you how do you advise people to uh, rise to that challenge? It varies with the person, but for most often foundationally. Um, and I I'm feeling a little sheepish about it because I am such a work oriented person, and not everybody is. But very sometimes at the root of procrastination is the feeling about that we should seek pleasure over work. After all, it's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, the pursuit of happiness or in the Declaration of Independence in the, you know, we, that the highest goal is the pursuit of happiness. And I would say rather that the highest goal is the pursuit of productivity and contribution. So if you're procrastinating applying for a job or procrastinating doing what you're supposed to, you are violating that core principle. You're saying, you know, I'd rather go get a burrito. I'd rather get laid. I'd rather watch, you know, watch TV. Um, and I think asking my client whether I, I stipulate to that, that I can't expect everybody to be as Calvinist as I am in my work ethic. But, you know, is your procrastination rooted in that and do you want to change? That's a question I might ask. Second, I might ask is very often we learn to be procrastinators in school because you wait and you procrastinate on that paper to the last second and lo and behold, you still get a good grade because of grade inflation. So it becomes a habit. You get addicted to the adrenaline and say, yeah, man, I'll wait till the last second and the adrenaline is going to help me get it done. And I would ask if, you know, I would point out that procrastination, adrenaline, adrenaline caused procrastination is, will work in much schooling, but not as well in the real world, especially for good jobs. And so I point that out and I ask them to what you know, extent was your procrastination the result of seeing that it worked in school and do you want to change it now? And then the third thing are symptomatic approaches. I will, for example, talk about the one second strategy. I would say, okay, you're looking at that big project and you say, Ugh, I can't stand the thought of doing that. I'm, I'm going to go take a hike. Uh, so, but thinking about it in terms of baby steps, the old proverbial baby steps, what's my first one second task? Is it to turn on the computer? Is it to open this book? Is it to, to, to think of a title? Uh, and breaking it down in those one second tasks can often uh, be helpful. I'll stop, there's much more, but I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I actually, there was one particular paper that, that has been, you know, waiting, or I've been waiting to do it. Uh, and I wrote instead of, <clears throat> there were about five questions 
on it and I said us doing answer one question I said write the first sentence <laughs> you know and that again it's not going to be it's not perfect but it's better than than nothing you know I, I want to ask you what what kind of um you've you've been in so many different industries and and you've a, a wide array of 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 expertise and and all that um and you were a broadcaster for quite a while and I want to ask you what was that like um you were in California when you did that so so was that enjoyable I, I presume you did enjoy it because you did it for so long or, or what was that like it's a drug it's like you know I'm actually quite a sad person by nature I'm not depressed but I'm a sad person by nature but you put a, a microphone in front of me and I'm a different person. Like the person you're seeing here is alive and energetic and happy. It's not an act. There is something about sitting in front of this microphone that turns me on, that makes me, and I also, some of it is just the intrinsic, but also is the feeling you can make a difference. I was on an NPR station for yeah, in San Francisco, a big market for almost for 30 years, 30 full years. And it felt exciting that I was going to potentially make a difference, you know, just by talking. And again, not everybody's going to feel that way. I have many weaknesses. I can't fix anything at all, but I can think on my feet and I can, I am very relaxed in front of a microphone. So I'm using my best skill to make a difference. And it's an adrenaline rush. Of course, I loved it. It's not for everybody, but I love being in front of a microphone. <laughs> and so you talked to people about, about careers mainly, or, or what was the, well, the main you know, focus? Yeah, I did some interview a lot of very interesting people. You talked to me off the air about it, Alan Dershowitz. Um, I, I interviewed a ton of people like that. Jack Welch, the GE CEO, all kinds of people. But the main part of the show was what, what were called three minute workovers. People would call in with their career problem. And partly just my natural ability, but partly because I had so much experience. I would help them come up with a real smart, either new career idea or a baby step within three minutes. So I did a lot of those three minute workovers that people would call in. And I never but, used a call screener. It was you really- You mean someone who stopped them, stopped them in advance, is that it? Huh? Is no that screen. someone who- No, I, I, deliberately, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I felt that I could, I, I felt it was good, authentic radio. I'm tired of BS. So I took them in the order received, period. Now, if they were a shitty caller, I would cut them off pretty quick and whatever. But most of them I worked with and helped try to help solve their problems. So yeah, uh, that's what I did. And the media in America is um, in, in kind of difficulty. And like for, for me personally, I would love to do something like this, but I know the chances of me getting a job in, in the mainstream media are quite slim. So here I am, you know. But right. I'm wondering wh what uh, <laughs> what do you see? Wh where would be a good place? Not a, not as to, to get a job or whatever, but but what sources do you think we can still rely on in America? Um, as as things become so emotional and polarized and partisan and, and not what it should be, probably. Separate question. My very favorite media outlet is C-SPAN. Uh, C-SPAN makes a tremendous effort to present the full range of responsibly held positions from the left to the right. And I love it. Uh, I really do decry the bias of the media. Uh, everybody talks about Fox, but anybody dispassionately, as I think we spoke on the air, they have made a real, they realize the country's moving leftward. So they have made a real effort to be balanced. Uh, one of the lead people on there is Juan Williams, a, a clearly liberal black uh, Washington Post guy. Um, it, it's actually the bias is unbelievable. I, I do not like Donald Trump, but I do not like the fact that CNN uh, was 24 seven nonstop Trump bashing. That's not that doesn't serve the common interest. While we may not like things about Donald Trump, there were certain policy beliefs that were worthy at least of fair discussion and not just 24 seven denigration. So I'm very concerned about most media with CNN, excuse me, with C-SPAN being a notable exception. I'm very concerned about the, uh, and this starts in the journalism schools where they teach, they teach the journalism students, you can no longer be objective, acknowledge your biases. So they, it's like giving them free reign to be as biased as they want in the New York Times or the networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, et cetera. And then the tremendous censorship of any views that don't comport with the liberal orthodoxy, with the redistributist, redistri what I call redistributist orthodoxy, which is taking more, as we said earlier in the show, from the society's producers to give to the least independent of merit, to, to just accept that as an article of faith. And that is the undercore pinning of what we see in all the major media. Uh, that doesn't, I believe, serve society in the long run. The media has an almost sacred secular obligation 
to present the full range of widely held perspectives so we can have the feisty discussions that we should be able to have rather than right now people unless you are by the complete leftist orthodoxy many many people who are thoughtful careful human beings have been forced into silence and that kind of censorship no more, as as mccarthyism from the left was no good for society this McCarthy, uh, McCarthyism from the right that was is not good for society. The McCarthyism from the left also that truncation of a free marketplace of ideas is ultimately bad for society. The um, uh, one big issue of contention or, or uh, let's say hot topic is that of the gender pay gap and male privilege, and uh, that's a term that's kind of thrown around. But but you have. I suppose another view on that, uh, where we maybe mightn't be seeing the full picture when we talk about these things. Yeah, you know, you can always say you can lie with statistics. Uh, The best data that I have seen, and most of it comes from, much of it comes from Dr. Warren Farrell, who wrote the book, Why Men Earn More, um, find that when you really control for all variables, uh, the pay is roughly equal. And in fact, uh, women under 25 earn more than men for the same job. But I know I teach in I'm, I'm, I'm I teach part time volunteer in the medical school at the University of California San Francisco, and so I have a particular interest in medicine and in doctors, and the the truth is that when you really don't just compare doctors with doctors or even pediatricians with pediatricians, but the actual number of hours worked or the number of really serious case severe cases problem cases when you really compare apples with apples. Women, if anything, are, well, I'll just, I don't want to be controversial, so I'll simply say roughly equal. Uh, so this, this broad brush statistic that Biden and others use, women are 82 cents on the dollar, is such a gross overstatement. Even because, for example, the average man who says he works full time works six hours more per week than the average woman who says she works six hours a week. So you really have to compare apples with apples on these politician and media parroted statements like women earn 82 cents in a dollar is a gross unfairness to men. And and one way you kind of thought about uh, addressing that, I think, was you were enthusiastic about setting up some sort of, was it, I don't know, was it a caucus or something, but some sort of uh, advocacy network or something. And there was a, um, or, or you, were, you were kind of supportive of it, maybe, though. Is that fair I, to say? I'll explain. Um, this war, aforementioned Warren Farrell's, one, there was... Right after the Obama administration created a White House Council on Women and Girls, um, seeing the plight of boys and men who commit suicide at a much higher rate than women who aren't going to college at a high rate, he he felt that it was, uh, and I agreed, was uh, important that there also be a council on boys and their issues. So he set up a council of people who who would try to work toward getting a White House Council on Boys and Men. And I was on that council. He started, it was not me. I was just a member. I was invited to be on the, the one of the hundred people who were on that commission. And it completely failed. And what was the failure? What did that look like? Or how did it fail? It just, it, we got, no, no attention? We got a bunch of meetings with middle level and high level people in the White House, but it ended up doing the you know, typical, they just kind of quietly blew it off. It never, never happened. Never and made. would whichever, did you think maybe, or have you ever wondered if it might be better off having neither, I suppose, I don't know, what does it cancel, does it cancel each other out if you have? Yeah, there are separate, I, you know, both. I have mixed feelings about it. There are, there are, girls do have separate needs from boys. And is there a need to have a separate look at the needs of girls and boys? Is there a separate need for looking at issues of African-Americans? Probably. Uh, Do I have a strong opinion about it? No. I think when we start to bifurcate people by race and gender, et cetera, there's a huge negative side effect, but I'm not, I also see an advantage. So I'm ambivalent. I'm looking at the clock and we do need to stop as far as I'm Yes. Let me just quickly ask you, I I appreciate your time this morning, but um, you have a video on on the life well led and uh, the meaning of life and all that. And I want to ask you, uh, to date, do you think you've done a good job at that? And are you are you at peace with with the way you've conducted yourself um, for for the last seventy years? And 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 um, and I don't know how how someone might learn from that or whatever. But but would you have a a parting a parting word on all of that? Yeah, I think most people end up feeling and say, yeah, I'm glad about the way I live my life. I have mixed feelings. I, I don't feel ashamed. I feel like. I have worked hard and ethically, I really do. And I'm grateful 
I'm an atheist, but I, if there were God, I'd be grateful that I've been still given my health, physical health and mental health, and I can still work as much as I did when I was 30. And I think as well, maybe I'm a better counselor today than I ever was. That said, there is a piece of me. We talked about infinite malleability. My career is about helping people grow and change. The older I get and the more I read the research, the more I realize that genetics is a important prerequisite in the same way as a Volkswagen, even if well-tuned is not gonna beat a Porsche in a race. There's a piece of me that feels like I'm working my ass off to try to help people, but I'm often fighting against both their genetics and their early upbringing. And if I was starting again, I, this may sound, and I'm not sure, maybe it's easy for me to say than not. I think I would have dropped out of high school. I would have been an autodidact. I love to learn. And I would have learned about the biological basis of this thing we call intelligence. And I would have tried to really understand it and become a researcher. I think I would have been a good genetic researcher on the biological basis of intelligence. And it would sort of come from a liberal perspective. If we could develop something what I call metaphorically an intelligence pill, we have spent 50 trillion, 50, uh, I want to get it right. We've spent a fortune over the last many decades trying to close the achievement gap and it's as wide as ever pretty much. And I think because we know that in every other regard, we are part genetic and part environment. If, we, if I could be one of the contributors to creating an, an intelligence pill that would be ethically distributed to the poor for free, like almost all medical services, that would at least, I think, improve the chances of the both uh, of closing the achievement gap so that we are both addressing the genetic and environmental component, but not exacerbating the, the rich poor difference. I think if I, I'm not sure, but I think if I was starting again, while I'm not ashamed of the life I've lived, I'm wondering whether I might've made a bigger difference being part of the effort to study the biological basis of cognitive thinking and reasoning. Well, Marty, uh, that's quite a, a task. Maybe someone, someone watching can take that on, you know, <laughs> but um, you've clearly done a lot and uh, I'm very grateful for you for giving me this time this morning. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. And if anyone wants to see your work, they can go to martynemko.com. Is that correct? M-A-R-T-Y-N-E-M-K-O. And your YouTube channel, same again, Marty Nemco. Um, but yeah, thanks a million for that. And, and I would ask uh, if anyone enjoyed this discussion have a look at marty's videos he has hundreds of them and he has plenty of articles and, and books and all of that um, and if you enjoyed this conversation please do share it with your friends and all that good stuff see you on sunday i'll be interviewing michael wilde from nobus.ie uh, who has a, another unconventional uh, look at the world where he is trying to recycle cigarette butts so seven o'clock irish time on sunday evening thanks a million Sloan tamil Fergus, I think.